Okay, we're live. It's we're we're really live this time. I promise you. Um, <laughs> Josh, appreciate you coming on board in the battle. Appreciate you uh, sitting down with me and spending some time. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Um, so I think you're the first Air Force Academy grad that I've had on the show. That's a big thing. Uh, fun fact. Uh, it, it is. It, it really is. Because uh, fun fact, um, one of uh, fifth grade Tanner Iskra's favorite movies was Independence Day. And this is before I knew anything different between uh, Marine Corps or Air Force or anything like that. But I just saw F-18s fighting aliens. And I was like, yeah, I want to do that. I'd want to do that. So really young in my life, I, I wrote to the Air Force Academy and they sent me back a big old package and the conduct of my congressman. I got a big package from them. So I do have some fond memories of, of the Air Force Academy, Academy from a fifth grade standpoint. Well, to all the kids listening, uh, it is definitely the best academy out there. So uh, it's the only one you need to apply to. Don't bother applying to the other ones. Air Force yeah. Academy is the best one. There you go. I don't have a uh, a preference as a Marine. I mean, I know there's Naval Academy, but it's just it's Could not. The, it's not it's the, also known as it's not the, Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> well, Josh, first question we always ask here on the Board of the Battle is: Everyone has a point in time when they know that the military service is going to be the next step in their life. And I say it in that way because sometimes, you know, with Vietnam veterans, it could be a draft, uh, a lot of, you know, or it could be volunteer. Um, when did you know that the military was going to be the next step in your life? For me, uh, I, I never really grew up in a military family. Um, my uh, parents sent me to space camp when I was in uh, fifth grade. And I actually had to get permission to go as a younger kid. And uh, I went to space camp and you got to like go play in the woods. And then there's another program called Aviation Challenge that I went to the next year and they play like Top Gun and you have to sit in the airplanes and, and shoot other planes down. And I remember coming home being like, how do I do this? And Is that like a simulator? Uh, my parents were like, yeah, it's like they build these huge airplanes and, and they literally just wow. play like the, air, the Top Gun soundtrack over and over again. And That's then awesome. like when you get shot down, they let you go play out in the woods and they try to capture you in the woods. And I remember coming home being like, how do I do this? And they're like, you go to the Air Force Academy. And to them, it was just like free college because they don't have to pay for college at that point. And to me, I went to the camp counselor the next day, not camp counselor, but school counselor. And they're like, here's a little booklet about how to apply to the service academies. And I remember taking that booklet and just going through it as a sixth grader and being obsessed. I mean, I, I would take that cover of the Air Force Academy and like trace it on like all my books and stuff. And I just became obsessed. And the, the school librarian had a son that went to the Air Force Academy and I became his friend. He like taught me everything about the Academy. And I remember when we moved to Colorado in seventh grade, um, the Air Force Academy had a program that you could mentor or like shadow cadet, but you couldn't do yeah. it until like high school. But like I wrote my congressman to get permission to do it as a middle schooler. And the Academy let me do it just because I bugged them so much. And wow. so I, I was just obsessed. Um, and the funny thing is I actually didn't get in the first time. Uh, I was rejected. And uh, like 15 days before I was set to go to uh, a regular civilian college, I got a letter uh, saying, hey, will you go do a prep school for a year? And if you do well, you'll get into the academy the following year. So I actually didn't get in <laughs> right away. Gotcha. But you were like, no problem. Absolutely. Let's do it. Yeah. Prep I mean, school. for me, yeah. it was like the only site I had. Like it was just... You know, this is what I saw as a kid. This is what I wanted to do. And that's all I ever wanted wanted to do. I think that's great that you kind of got, it sounds like you got the same packet idea. You just kept going with it. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. yeah. It's pretty awesome. Um, so what year did you enter the Academy? I entered the Academy in 2005. Okay. And you commissioned in what year? 2009. Okay. 2009. So at the time, um, you were uh, a gay man that was serving under Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And I'm only bringing that up because this was a large part of your military story, right? Um, you were actually blackmailed for this at the time. Yeah, more than once um, at the Air Force Academy. and then More than the once? Yes. Wow. Um, you mind going into some of that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I mean, the Air Force Academy um, was the first time uh, – you know, I started a network of LGBT uh, cadets 
um, you know, it's a very lonely time um, when you're there and you don't really have any other gay people to meet. Um, you're kind of there pretending and kind of college is the time you, you find out who you are as a person. And, uh, you know, I was dating someone at the time and after we broke up, I was kind of alone. And um, there was an instructor who found out I was gay and, you know, um, was harassing me. And at that point, I just tried to find other cadets. And at some point, um, he tried to take Har- advantage harassing of you, harassing you, Harassing you in what way? You know, uh, you know, asking like sexually harassing, um, you know, and after he found other cadets too, he tried to take advantage of that situation and, and try to expose us. You know, um, it's not uncommon or it wasn't at the time to be like, hey, you know, if you, you know, don't do sexual favors, I'll expose you for being gay and get kicked out. And, wow. you know, even if you're just a cadet at the time, those threats to you, even if hollow, really scare you. Um, yeah. And so at that time, sure. I, I saw it as an opportunity to kind of just find as many other cadets at, as possible. And, yeah. um, you know, I look back at the time now, and it's, it's kind of a funny thing. We like met down the tunnels. The Air Force Academy has this like cool tunnel complex underneath it. And we met underneath there. And, you know, but we had a really cool community. We'd go down to Denver um, and, and really had a sense of community there. Um, and that kind of took off to the other service academies as well. West Point had their own community. The Naval Academy did. And that, you know, that went to other bases. Um, and it started to take off on the internet. MySpace, you know, we had a... a like old hidden, MySpace. <laughs> yeah, we had a hidden social net group, uh, network on, on MySpace. And we'll get into how this transformed into Facebook later because... Sure. Um, but... It started really on MySpace. But then after I graduated from the Air Force Academy, I was sent to Biloxi, Mississippi, where I was in finance school. And within the first two days, um, I I was still building this network at the time throughout the Air Force. And um, one of the first people I found was my finance instructor. And um, he immediately started asking for sexual favors to help for, uh, you know, to change my test scores. And I was like, no. And um, I actually failed my first finance exam. And uh, we, it was like a little bubble Tron. And after we, after he graded the test, he handed them back to me and I slid it to my neighbor who was a friend of mine and all of mine were marked correct, but you could see that they were wrong. And my neighbor was like, what happened? And I explained it to him, this is what's going on. And the next time, uh, it, the exact opposite happened. I was all right, but he had failed me. And I slid it to my, my neighbor again, and it just kept going on like that. And then the instructor started showing up to my hotel room. And at that point, um, you know, one of the best allies we actually had in the military was the chaplain corps. And so I went to the, the chaplain and the chaplain helped me actually file a complaint, um, which I did. And I turned the instructor in. And at that point, the instructor turned around and outed me. I was put under um, uh, investigation. I had my cat card taken away. Uh, My commander removed me um, from my job. I literally was moved to the the chaplain's office. And I was like, I I could you not. At one point, I was like helping clean out the basement, moving Bibles around. And I mean, but the chaplain was the nicest person in the world, like a great support system, but like, um, you know, I was put under investigation for this kind of stuff, even though I was a victim of, of this, this crime. Guilty um, in, until, until proven. And also the investigation came back and, and the guy not only turned out to be doing this to me, but students in past classes to male and female students. So, uh, I mean, it, it came, the investigation came back that he was doing this to multiple students. Just a just bad me. dude. All, just a bad dude all around. Yep. Wow. And ultimately, this during this time is when I got so fed up with the system that I ended up just being like, I'm going to organize as much as I can. And this little small group of 150 people in the military turned into a couple hundred at that point. Um, wow. And that's my time in activism where I started to really organize. I, uh, you know, I really, 
you know, talking about being a little kid, all you want to do from the air, you know, going to the air force Academy Academy and then having that happen. I can only imagine like, okay, yeah, the fear is there to not lose something that you've been looking forward to since like sixth grade. Right. So absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so how did OutServe start? Um, and, and for those that, that don't use the antiquated social media, like MySpace and Facebook, um, this was a Facebook group at the time or a MySpace group. How did it all start? So it started as a MySpace group, but then, um, after I became active duty, um, we started as a Facebook group. So Facebook, um, right at this time, right after I graduated created, they, they seem like a big thing now, but Facebook groups were brand new in 2009. And yeah. so we created a hidden Facebook group, um, that people could not see. And we called it observe. Um, and we started adding people and you had to know someone else to get added to the group. And two other people had to vouch for you to get into the group. Gotcha. And we just kept adding more and more people to it. What was, uh, what was the purpose behind the group? What was the reason for it? It was to just simply find other people. Um, you know, if you could go to another base, um, you could simply find a friend and this thing really took off. I mean, and people like, People for the first time are meeting other people, especially in deployed zones. Um, in Afghanistan, people were meeting weekly uh, at the Green Bean to just, you know, meet and like get to know each other. And that had never happened before. Um, and so even if I moved from, you know, McGuire Air Force Base to McDill, I could find someone and actually get to know those people. And that's what, you know, was really happening. So this one Facebook group then split off to all these other chapters around the country. And that was just the social aspect. Um, yeah. It was like more of a support network type of thing than anything yeah. else. Gotcha. Yeah. And then, and then we, we turned it more into an activist network when um, president Obama announced that he was going to tackle repeal it. Don't ask, don't tell. We saw an opportunity then to turn it into an activist network as well. Um, and that, that took a whole you different turn. Got you. Yeah. Um, you know, you talked about your own personal blackmail and you're talking about, you know, uh, it seems that through this group, many people, you know, especially around that time, even Pentagon officials found out about many detrimental things, scenarios that nobody had even thought of that were exacerbated by Donuts Don't Tell. Um, how did you find personally, how did you find the courage to be not only an administrator of this Facebook group, um, going by the mysterious name of JD Smith, um, but even represent this community in interviews where you had to hide your face. At, at that point, I just had reached, I was just so fed up, right? Like at some point, you know, when I was, you know, I can vividly remember being pulled into my commander's office, being like, what is going on with this instructor in this blackmail situation? And yeah. she was like, if you do not tell me what's going on right now, you're being removed from this unit. And I kid you not, she, she took me from the office and dragged me over to dra Jag and I could not, I'll never forget that trauma. And I was, I was so just upset. And I remember like call, like calling like one or two people at the time and just like breaking down and just being like, like, what is like, what is happening? And at that point you've just got like nothing to lose. And, you know, you, either I'm going to be thrown out of the military or something. And at that point you just want to do something. And, and at that point I was just like, I've got to organize. And if, if I'm going out, I'm going out swinging. Yeah, and exactly. Yeah. And I, I, I'd rather help people at that point. Gotcha. Um, and so that's what I, I saw that as the only option. And, I mean, yeah. when you, when you went on these interviews, you, you know, you went on, uh, you know, some national, you know, syndicate, I mean, you went on ABC news, Fox, uh, Fox MSNBC, CNN, it, a lot of these didn't even change your voice. I noticed, yeah, like, um, I was, did you ever worry about getting outed before you could legally do so? <laughs> yeah. So, so one of the people that I reached out to first was a, a really good friend of mine. His name was Ty Wallride. Um, and he was like my civilian counter, the co-founder the whole time. I, he was a friend I had met actually randomly in Vegas. And he was one of the very first people I was like, this is what's going on. You've got to help me. And he was the person that would be the, you know, face a lot as a civilian person when I couldn't be out there. And he helped organize everything okay. when I couldn't, but then, um, we knew were there, that we were there put, many other were there many other veterans or civilians in the group at the time? No, um, he was about the only one okay. at the very very start. Um, he was gotcha. the, the person that would start dealing with the White House and the Pentagon at the beginning, 
And then we saw the opportunity to, you know, let's just, let's just play this out. And, um, and like you said, as I went on to Rachel Maddow or go, you know, Bob Woodward would interview me. They would be like, you want to change your voice? And be like, no. And they're like, and they would ask me why. I was like, cause it's creepy. Like, you know, the biggest thing is so that, that was your choice. Yeah. Um, and uh, it was funny because there were coworkers that heard some of these interviews and they would like forward other, co- like the, like the interviews to other coworkers would be like, is this Lieutenant Seafried? And I mean, they wouldn't say anything, but like, it definitely was, you know, they wouldn't ask me, but uh, I, yeah, it was definitely my choice because the whole campaign was making LGBT people sound like human because everyone else didn't think we were humanized. And so it was definitely my choice to, to always try to sound as human as possible. And if um, it, if it happened to come out that yeah. it was you, you were just like ready for it or. Yeah. And, uh, but we also knew that it couldn't always be me and shadow and shadow. That's why I reached out to other veterans. Um, a woman by the name of Katie Miller, um, who was a West Point grad who, um, didn't want to stay in anymore because don't ask, don't tell wasn't, um, you know, part of her, uh, you know, ethics anymore. She resigned. She was in the top 10 at West point. So she reached out to me and we helped her resign. Um, and you know, at that point, I don't remember in this story, but lady Gaga got really involved in don't ask, don't tell. So yeah. she, she was, she was lady Gaga's date. So we, we'd find people like Katie Miller to go do these things with like lady Gaga or Jonathan Hopkins, who was an Iraqi translator, like, and we'd find these vets that were very high profile and, and then do things like this because it was all about visibility at that point. And, yeah. and the more we could humanize everyone and put them in the press, that's what was going to help. And that's what I saw outsurge role as is that we weren't the people that were going to help the legislation necessarily, but we knew how to pull press um, and, and do Perfect. everything like that. Very good. Very good. So you became a shattered, shadowed, but uh, a very public figure in the fight to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Do you remember the day it was repealed? Weren't you when, didn't you say you were in the, uh, in like the, in the chamber? Yeah. So what's weird is that there's actually two dates that it technically got repealed. Um, okay. When the legislation actually got passed, um, there was then a time period in which it had to have a study and then it actually got implemented. So President Obama signed the legislation in December, which I was in the chamber for, but I technically, it wasn't repealed yet. So I actually sat behind uh, Valerie Jarrett and a couple of other president's um, advisors, and um, I got snuck in um, kind of because the press couldn't take my picture. Even though other, other advocates didn't know technically who I was, they still just knew me as, you know, J.D. Smith. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, but Valerie Jarrett knew who I was because, you know, I was going into the White House, going into the Pentagon. And you can't go into those places as J.D. Smith. The White House and Pentagon knew who I was. <laughs> yeah. And I'll never forget, like, as President Obama signed the legislation, Valerie Jarrett just gave me a big old hug and smile. And um, it was amazing. It was an amazing feeling. But one of the things that a lot of people don't remember is that there was still an eight-month period after that legislation was signed that I was still in the closet. Because we had to wait until the DOD said that everyone was ready for repeal to actually take effect. So, gotcha. Uh, so there's the, day, the day. day there's the day of the signing, and then the day of implementation. Correct. So gotcha. I went home and you know spent another eight months in the closet. But we did a lot of in those eight months to get ready for repeal um, to uh, to actually help change the culture of the military. And I think during those eight months are some of the biggest impacts we actually helped with the DOD. What were some of the things that had to change? So, I mean, some of the biggest uh, things or the arguments that these people said that we're going to hurt the DOD were like, you know, it's going to hurt readiness. You know, when repeal happens, we're going to have, you know, all this chaos. So we wanted to make sure that when this happened, nothing changed. And so we wanted to, again, you know, basically rip off the bandaid as much as possible. So a couple of things that we did was uh, we got a magazine uh, circulating uh, on bases before repeal. And this actually was one of the one of the funniest things because the Pentagon really was scared about this, which proved our point. So um, AFES, which is, you know, that uh, runs the stores on bases, runs on a completely different distribution system than the BX and stuff like that. So 
um, one of my good friends at the time, or actually a good friend now, Jonathan Mills, um, reached out to AFES and published this whole magazine and then got AFES to distribute it about 90 days before repeal happened. And it was on the front page of CNN.com um, wow. for you know two whole days. And I won't, I won't forget like the call from the Pentagon being like, what, what are you guys doing? Like repeal hasn't happened yet. And we're like, we're not doing anything. Like this is just a magazine. But then three days later, that freak out ends. So it proved our point. It's like, there's this big scary magazine and then it's over a week later. And yeah. we're showing that there's nothing wrong. And then during this time, we were, you know, organizing a conference that would take place three days after repeal. So repeal happened. And then three days later, we had a conference of over 200 active duty service members in Vegas um, to bring together repeal people that also had um, international service members that were LGBT at the time, too. Interesting. Yeah, I remember that time. Uh, I was in D.C. at the time, and uh, I remember that you talk about the big scary thing, three days, things like that. I remember uh, I was in the chamber for all the service chiefs when uh, they had to testify in front of Congress over this. And I, I remember thinking, I was like, you know, we, we do hearings all the time. And I was in a lot of hearings and at the time, and it was like, we do hearings on how many weapons we're going to buy for the next 10 years, how many airplanes, uh, ships, guns, um, uh, water on Camp Lejeune, all kinds of stuff. And there'd be no press there. And there would be like half of the the committee, you know, in Congress or Senate would, would show up. But for that one, for the, for the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, for that testimony, it's like everybody was there on the, on the panel. And there was so much media that I couldn't even hardly get my camera in to where I normally, I, I had to like shove some elbows. Cause like, okay, this is where I'm at. I'm here every week guys, but you know, so it was amazing to me to see that. Uh, that much attention on that one issue when there's so many other, other tensions in the military that's like, you need to pay just as much attention on everything else as well. Like this is, you know, important, but it's like, it was just amazing to me to see the dichotomy of, of what people would cover and what people wouldn't just based on public perception. You and know? one of the things we were most scared about was that, you know, if, if we didn't have a lot of military members come out on day one, we would then have a story about here's a gay military member here on day 20, here's one day, you know, 45. By doing we in the magazine, we had over 100 people come out on day one, and that was the story. Here's 100 service members that came out that are doing their job on day one. Nothing's changed. Yeah. And so there was no trickle of all these service members coming out. It was just business as normal. You know, not, nothing really changed. The whole yeah, story. You, you're talking about how nothing changed in the military. What changed for the service members that, that were able to come out? I mean, everything changed, you know, like, I mean, they're, they got to breathe a sigh of relief. Uh, I mean, and, and they got to go in and, and, you know, not have that stress, not have that, you know, it, it, yeah. it, it just feels like the whole burden is off you. Like, I mean, it's one of the things that like, you don't know whether or not I go back to the time I draw, I draw this parallel to myself because when I was back at the air force Academy, I had to make the decision whether or not I wanted to be a pilot or not. And I chose not to become a pilot because there was that 11 year commitment. And I, at that point, I was like, I don't think I could live in the closet that long. And so I chose mm -hmm. to not become a pilot because of that. And, you know, now I look back at those kids who are now at the Air Force Academy who can now, you know, bring a same sex couple to a date or, you know, ring dance and things like that. But they don't have to live with that choice anymore. They can now serve a whole career. But like back then, it's like, you know, that's, that's what's changed for these people is they don't have to make those kind of career decisions that I did and other people have to do that, that other people have to live with. That's outstanding. That's outstanding. It's, it's, it's not even a, a career decision anymore. It's not even a thought. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, I can personally remember that not the day, but the year I, I had a fellow sergeant that was uh, fabulous and gay and, and nobody cared. We all loved him. And, and, but he did, however, come into the boss's office, uh, you know, a couple months before it was uh, maybe it was signed. I don't know. Maybe that's the reason he did it. Um, and she didn't care either, but he announced it at that, at that point, he's like, you know, I remember, and I remember us just saying, dude, you're, you're going to be able to say this out loud soon enough. Like, like hold tight, you know? Um, no, I, I can definitely, it's cool that, um, uh, like you said, those, those career decisions, you don't even have to make those anymore. Um, very yeah. good. What, while you were in, give me either a, a best friend or your greatest mentor. My best friend was definitely, um, my co-founder of the organization, uh, Ty Walride, um, 
you know, he was the one that helped me through that whole process. He was the first, first person I called when I was blackmailed. And he's the one that helped me found this whole organization. And he's someone that I call to this day when we bounce business ideas off each other. You know, mm-hmm. he's founded a few companies. I founded a few companies and we bounce ideas off left and right. Um, uh, so he's definitely my best friend, you know, left and right. I have a few mentors. I definitely have some bit like best advice I've had. Um, I definitely don't have like one or two best mentors, but I definitely have been given some of the best advice in my my life by a few people. Um, from Cleve Jones, um, who is a, a a big person to Harvey Milk, has given me some of the best advice I ever had. Um, and hit, and you can see it probably from the interview we've done just now is, um, you know, when trying to create change, press is one of the most important things, and that it, uh, uh, that it's all about visibility and showing people that. Um, that you're there and that's going to change people's minds that, and that's what drove us to do the things like the hundred people on day one and his advice about, you know, showing press that you're not the scary monster is what's going to, you know, win the, the, the people's minds over the heart, the hearts and minds. Gotcha. The heart, gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Hearts and minds. <laughs> there, there it is. No worries. Um, so when and why did you eventually leave active duty? You know, at some point it's, you know, I think a lot of it was that, you know, activism is a, is a really hard thing to do. And uh, I think, you know, it really did burn me out. And I mm. think that definitely did tie into my whole active service. Yeah, I, was what really was your, well, I, I didn't even ask you, what was your MLS during the entire time that you were in? <laughs> activism? <laughs> I mean, I really did have a un, a, a very different military career than everyone else. And I think that's what, you know, really probably was part of the reason I had to leave, um, you know, because this did become my life during my active and, and, and it was going to follow me everywhere. Um, mm-hmm. And I was very young when this all happened. You know, uh, I was, you know, 22 when this started, you know, yeah. uh, and, and, you know, yeah, that, you know, rising to that type, type of leadership so young really burned me out and I had to take a break from all that. And so like, after I left the air force, I started travel startups. That was about sailing. And, you know, and I took the time to like, go, <laughs> you, you work. went out, man. You went, you went I, for a boat ride. <laughs> <laughs> I really did. I worked in the travel industry for four you years and, and focused on travel startups. And, um, you know, I've traveled around the world from Cambodia to Thailand, to Sweden. And I took the time to really just, uh, reflect we also built some awesome startups <laughs> and uh and i've learned a lot during that time um i've really gained some great entrepreneurial skills that um i'm also excited just to bring back to the government too so but i also just was excited to step away from you know the military because it was my time the military did you did, did you full did you totally full you know go go off of activism too did, were you just like hey entrepreneurial decompress a little bit of a little you bit of never get away from activism <laughs> Like okay. once you're in it, you're in it. I'll give you a prime yeah. example. Um, in the sailing industry, when I was in it, you, I found the same thing with don't ask, don't tell. There, um, you know, I was back. I was back into classes where you have to get some certifications. And I remember being in a classroom, and it's the same kind of thing. You're kind of like the only out gay person there. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. And as you're starting to go out with all these people, you know, I was it was weird to be out and it was kind of like, Oh, this is, you're kind of closeted again. And I was like, this isn't cool. So I, I, you know, was out again. Um, and then there's a really big TV show below deck. Everyone's probably, a lot of people probably see My wife it. loves it. My wife loves it. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, you become friends with some of those people and then, you know, you talk to them and then they start bringing on gay cast members and it starts, you know, changing that culture. And then, you know, you start getting the activism on there. And so like I, we, uh, what some of the startups I worked on, we did a big, uh, LGBT racing team. Um, and we made a big thing, a big deal about how we're going to be the first LGBT racing team in a, a international regatta, which we did down the British Virgin islands. And if you look down at some of the press on that, it was a huge international press poll that we did this big LGBT racing thing down there. Um, and so, it's, uh, you know, you never get away from the activism angle. Yeah. Until there's hopefully that for a no need of the, the activism, until it's just exactly. a normal thing. Well, right? It goes back yeah. to that, you know, that visibility thing, things like below deck are, are, are doing some great activism 
just because of the visibility, right? You're seeing a great uh, a lesbian captain in the yachting industry just by visibility. Yeah. Um, and that's, it, it's, it pushes barriers. So yeah, you can never get away from activism no matter what you do. Gotcha. Very good. Um, well, hopefully could, again, hopefully there comes a day where you don't need the activism. It just becomes a thing, right? It's yeah. just not even a thing. It's just, it's just normal life. Yeah. Um, what brought you back to, to government, to VA, um, after, after all this? I always told myself there'd be two agencies I would come and work for. Um, the first one would be VA because I just love, you know, veterans are great. The second one would be uh, uh, um, National Park Service uh, because I, I, you know, I'm Leslie Nope at heart. I'd want to work for the Park Service, <laughs> you yeah. know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but no, I, I mean, I, there's so much work to be done still with veterans, and especially in the LGBTQ space. You know, the secretary has already announced, you know, that we're doing a big review of the policies here, um, yep. you know, and there's a lot to do in this space. So uh, I'm looking forward to what we do and, and and being a part of that. So you are being a part of that. I hear, you know, we've talked about it. Uh, what are some things that you're seeing that 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 do need to change? Well, I mean, the first thing that I think what we need to do is just review everything. But the secretary has already put out there. The secretary is doing a great job of saying, hey, we're going to review all the policies and see exactly what needs to change. And he's got a great idea of, of, we need to just treat everyone with respect and make sure that we're doing what the president has laid out exactly and see what we need to do to change. So that's, that's, that's great that they're, they're, they're getting your, your experience and, and on that board and, you know, who, who will look forward to see what, what, what changes, if yeah. anything. Um, I, I do know that you're, you're in our meeting in our office at least once a week. Um, I still had to look up what you did. Honestly, I was doing my research, strategic communications for OIT for IT uh, for people. I don't know. That's the office of, you know, uh, IT here for the VA. Why does VA IT need external strategic communications? <laughs> well, we're one of the, just, just we're, question, we're, man. <laughs> well, we're one of the largest IT infrastructures in the world. And mm. that, means that we have to have an external communications team. Um, and that's just not with media, but that's also with Congress and, okay. uh, you know, speaking engagements and getting out there. And that means uh, we need it for a couple of reasons. First, we need to be able to attract a great workforce, right? Uh, yeah. We're such a big uh, tech team. We need to be attractive to take people from the Airbnbs, the Apple, and to be able to do that, we need to have that external communication to say, hey, come work for us. We also need to let the general public know what we're doing in the IT space. If we're not telling veterans what we're doing to get them their benefits, to get them uh, the best care and showing them that we're in that cutting edge, then we're not doing our job to tell them what we're doing to be the best in the cutting edge healthcare space and things like that. So we need to be able to communicate that stuff and especially when IT, IT is where everything's being creative and changing right now, we definitely need all that communication going to Congress and things like that directly. And that that's why it needs its own little arm. Gotcha. Yeah, I think I said, I think I saw in a news release something like over $2 billion is going to VA IT. So it's in order to keep that kind of funding, you kind of got, got to let Congress know what they're doing with that $2 billion. Yeah. I understand that. Uh, help help compete against the apples and the Silicon Valley. Got that. Okay. Very good. Um, what is one thing that you learned during your time in the military that you apply to what you do today? Taking care of the people, you know, I think that's one of the things that I learned in the military that I definitely apply now. Um, especially being an officer in the military, watching the airmen, and especially I go back to the story about when the cat card was taken away from me. And remembering that trauma of being taken over and dragged to the JAG. I never want to be treated like that because I remember that kind of trauma. And I think about some of the instances that I have saw other commanders treat other people. And I never want to be treated like that. And so that's something that I really care about now coming into the workplace. And, you know, you're all going to make mistakes as leaders somewhere down the line. And I've definitely made mistakes the past few years and how, you know, you treat people and stuff. But mm. nowadays I always try to treat people with respect and put people first because that's what matters. If you treat people per with respect, they're going to want to work for you no matter yeah. what. 
And so I always try to try to put that as the forefront is is people first and uh, you know the job comes second because that's what matters. Well, if you take care of the people, the job will get taken care of. Exactly. Yeah, you know, people will run through brick walls. If, you, if, you, if you're an effective leader and you take care of your people, your people will run through brick walls for you. Exactly. You know? And that's been shown through time and time again in any kind of leadership scenario, especially in the military. Exactly. Um, okay. Very good. Um, Josh, is there anything else that I may have missed or haven't asked that you think is important to share? No, I think you nailed everything that we could talk okay. about. How about, how, about a, how about a parting shot for anybody that might be listening to this and – and, uh, you know, they're thinking about, uh, VA services or a professional you know, I, transition or, or I anything. think you kind of joked about like, why did I come back to the government? And I would have, if you would have asked me about 10 years ago, 20 years ago, or even like three years ago, if I were to ever come back, work for the private government, I would have told you no way. Um, and you know, now that I'm back, even just for the past six months, I can't tell you how much I love it, you know? Um, it's, it's really is a great place to work and actually change and affect people's lives. Um, especially in the civilian workforce. And I really think people need to really look at it because, and, and I have two younger brothers and I, and I've encouraged them to really look at this. And I think people should. I was um, right there with you, man. When I first got out, I was like, I don't want anything to do with the government. And then I, yeah. you look back and you, and you look back and go, okay, being a civilian government worker is a little different than being in the military. And I think veterans especially have that, um, you know, that outlook because it's maybe you experience bad leaders in, in the military and maybe you're, you're scarred in some kind of way. And you're like, you're just like, I, I, I want to run away so much. And I definitely was one of those people. And it, you just maybe need to talk to some people in the civilian service to be like, hey, make that transition and, and, and think about that, that, that maybe it's a, a fit for you because it, it definitely was for me. Well, Josh, I appreciate your time. Thanks for coming on. Um, we are out. Great, hey, it's great, succinct. We we made like under thirty minutes. Uh, that's or under forty minutes. That's awesome. Uh, appreciate your time, and uh, we're out. Thanks. Here we go, lock and load. Oh, three thirty-one. Lug a thousand rounds, and I ain't bringing back one.